Greetings and welcome back again, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo Montgomery here, as usual, welcoming you to the exciting conclusion of our little dime store overview of poetry in the Tang Dynasty. CHP episode, Deuce and a Quarter, part eight. For everyone who might have been pining for a nice deep dive into all the fine points and critical analysis of the subject matter, I hope you weren't too terribly disappointed. But I did provide you with some great links to enough Tang Dynasty poetry to last you almost, but not quite, a lifetime. Last episode in Part 7, we looked at the Middle Tang period and focused on three of the biggies, who were all friends, Bai Zhu Yi, Yuan Chen, and Xue Tao. They all got to bask in the afterglow of the destruction caused during the years of the Anlu Shan Rebellion. Now, before we dive right into the late Tang period and the poet superstars of that sad time and all their melancholy poetry, let's squeeze in one more Middle Tang poeta famoso. This one intrigued me quite a bit, maybe because he was considered to be so strange. I'm talking about Li He. Now, he didn't have what they called Renzhai, or human talent. People said Li He that he had Guizhai, demon's talent, the talent of an evil spirit or ghost. His poetry was so unconventional and downright disturbing to the traditionalists who like their Liu Shi and Jeju Penta and Hepta syllabic quatrains and easy-to-follow rules. And then along came this guy. Those in the early 9th century didn't know what to make of Li He. You know, they called Li Bai the Shi Xian, the poet immortal. Du Fu was the Shi Sheng, the poet sage. And Li He, he was the Shi Gui, the poet demon or devil. He was born in Yiyang County, just to the west of Luoyang. Like several of the poets I've mentioned in this series, his birth year is in dispute. It was somewhere around the year 790, during the time of Tang Emperor Dezong and that long and unstable reign. His father claimed some distant relation to the Li royal family. You remember Li Yuan and Li Shermin, the two co-founders of the Tang dynasty? All subsequent emperors of the Tang dynasty were surnamed Li. After Dezong, eunuchs sort of took control of the levers of power. And throughout all the millennia of Chinese history, when eunuchs ran things on behalf of the emperor, when do you ever hear of a dynasty that lived happily ever after? Whatever we know of Li He comes from the old and new books of Tang, a couple of the official histories of that dynasty, when at seven years of age he had the opportunity to meet the great Han Yu, the scholar official extraordinaire he composed a poem. Like Wang Wei, he was another wunderkind who exhibited extraordinary promise. Han Yu even became a patron and Li He's biggest supporter. He was a little too eccentric for words. John D. Frodsham, professor emeritus at Murdoch University, who passed in 2016, translated many poems by Li He and published them in a book called The Collected Poems of Li He. I'll have a link to it in the episode notes. Professor Frodshem noted that the morning routine for this poet was to rise early, set out on horseback until he received that jolt of inspiration. He'd stop his horse, write a poem, and then throw it away. And then one of his servants or someone who followed him would retrieve the discarded poem and save them in a tapestry bag. And Li He himself kept all his poems safe in a bag of his own. Only 240 of his poems survived into our day. But in his own time, he was quite prolific. It's just that most of his work never made it, and he had a lot of detractors. And don't go looking for any Li He poems in the Tang Shi San Bai Shou. He got left out on purpose. And not just the 300 Tang poems. Plenty of other Tang Dynasty anthologies omitted him as well. Let's just say many influencers throughout the centuries had pretty strong feelings about him. And it wasn't until late in the Qing that Li He received the recognition he enjoys today, which means perhaps he was more than a thousand years ahead of his time. In his short life, he acted as the outsider, 
bucking the Confucian tradition and all the sensibilities that went with those established ways of writing poetry. All kinds of words have been used to describe Li He, and they all rhyme with non-conforming. The dates of Li He's birth and death are not even agreed on. And like a lot of figures from this ancient period, whatever we know from the texts that survived through the ages is a case of, who knows. He's been described as thin and sickly in his appearance, tall and cadaverous, a heck of a unibrow, and overly long fingernails, white hair. He frequented brothels, and it's been suggested that the diseases most associated with this brothel lifestyle was what killed him sometime around the year 816. He only lived to 26 or 27. Despite the promise he had shown as a young un and having someone as eminent as Han Yu standing in his corner, his career in the Tang civil service was marked with a dramatic controversy and ended up being miserable. Li He only served in a few unpalatable postings. Whether this hastened his decline and early demise is a matter of speculation. It could have been the accumulated disappointments or perhaps his addiction to wine and women. Who's to know for sure? But his dark, sensual, airy, and bizarre poems and the provocative images he evoked, well, it wasn't for everyone. But I'll tell you one person who dug Li He's poems, Chairman Mao. He was a big fan of the San Li, the three Li's, Li Bai, Li He, and the poet we're going to get to in a moment, Li Shang Yin. These three Tang poets, surnamed Li, were all admired by the great helmsman, and say what you want about Mao. He knew his poetry and could argue the merits and deficiencies of any poem with any scholar. So Li He got swept under the rug for a very long time. But he got to enjoy his comeback and the weird, obscure, and otherworldly language he used to express himself really hit the mark. If not for the two poets we're going to discuss next, who wrote of Li He, it's very likely he never would have been appreciated and his scant catalog of poems wouldn't have survived. Li He's close friend, named Shan Tzu Ming, was entrusted with Li's work on his deathbed and he dutifully took all these 233 poems and placed them in a safe place where they languished for 15 years. After this decade and a half, Shen Ming one day opened the trunk and reacquainted himself with these poems and was so moved that he approached the two late Tang poets we're going to look at next, Du Mu and Li Shangyin, and asked them to write a few Nice words for the collection of poems of Li He he was compiling. Everything written about Li He, well, we can't take it at face value. Like strawberry fields, where Li He is concerned, nothing is real. But it's like that for a lot of Chinese history from these centuries from so long ago. These stories and bios were inscribed into these histories, like the Xin Tang Shu, the New Book of Tang, and in bios taken from so many other anthologies and compilations. And these stories became the legend. J.D. Frodsham, who understood Li He as well as any Western translator could, said of him, quote, Although famous in the ninth century and never quite forgotten, he offended conventionality by his individuality and its health and balance by his morbidity and violence. To see his peculiar qualities as virtues required the breakdown of traditional literacy standards in the 19th and 20th centuries, end quote. Let me read one of Li He's more famous poems. I lifted this one from David Hinton's translation from his Anthology of Classical Chinese Poetry. You could find it amongst the links and resources I included in the episode notes. It's called Meng Tian, Dreaming of Heaven. Lao Tu Han Chan Qi Tian Si Yun lo ban kai bi xie bai, yu lun ya lu shi tuan guang, luan pei xiang feng gui xiang mo, huang chen qing shui san shan xia, geng bian qian nian ru zou ma, yao wang qi zhou jiu dian yan, yi hong hai shui bei zhong xie, 
A moon's old rabbit and cold toad, weeping colors of sky. Lucent walls slant across through half-open cloud towers. A jade-pure wheel squeezes dew into bulbs of wet light. Phoenix waste jewels meet on cinnamon-scented paths. Transformations of a thousand years gallop by like horses. Yellow dust, soon seawater below changeless island peaks. And all China, seen so far off, it's just nine wisps of mist, and the ocean's vast clarity, a mere cup of spilled water. Well, let's move on to Du Mu and Li Shang Yin and the late Tang period. Du Mu lived from 803 to 852, and Li Shang Yin, 813 to 858, so they were contemporary with each other. In Chinese, you'll hear Li Bai and Du Fu referred to as Da Li Du, big or great Li and Du. To differentiate from these two titans of Tang poetry, Du Mu and Li Shang Yin were called Xiao Li Du, or little or lesser Li and Du. Du Mu was born in the capital, Chang'an, and grew up in the household of his grandfather, the grand counselor for Emperor De Zong. And aside from this high-paying job working for the emperor himself, Du Yu's other claim to fame was the compilation of the Tongdian. This 200-chapter work that survived to our day gives a very detailed picture of Tang Dynasty institutions, laws, rights, and military affairs. It's one of those ancient works that isn't that well known, but did wonders to offer up a treasure trove of details about those times in 7th and 8th century China. Having a grandfather such as this allowed young Du Mu to enjoy a nice, comfortable existence at the family compound in Fan Chuan. This is around present-day Xi'an in the Chang'an district, just south of the city. Except Du Yo eh, died in 812, and nine-year-old Du Mu and the rest of the Du family fortunes fell off the end of the table. But Du Mu got by okay, and by the age of 25, he had passed the Jin Shi exam fifth highest score, and began what was to be another utterly unspectacular and mundane career in government service. He had a number of unimpressive postings in Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Anhui, Jiangxi, and Hubei. The city he's most associated with was probably Yangzhou, where he spent about 10 years. His family was always broke and just kept their head above water thanks to Du Mu's position in the civil service. In the final years of his career, he served in the capital, but he died in 852 at the age of 49. Du Mu's age of poetry was called the Late Tang, Wan Tang. When he was born, Li Bai had already been gone for 40 years. History was not kind to the Late Tang. The royal family's fortunes, after a brief but lukewarm rally, were decidedly in a drastic decline and the familiar signs that spelled troubles for rulers all the way into the Republican era were present in the late Tang. Warlordism, eunuchs running affairs, invasion from without, peasant unrest, and natural disasters. When it all came crashing down in 907, the greatest empire to date in Chinese history dissolved and was followed by the seven gloomy decades of the five dynasties and ten kingdoms period. In 979, China will be rescued by Zhao Kuangyin and reach even greater heights under the Song dynasty that he founded. And these northern Song rulers, officials, and scholars all looked back to the Tang for inspiration about everything that was great about China. But during the time of Du Mu and all these late Tang poets, times were pretty dismal. The Kaiyuan era of 713 to 741 was already a distant age in Du Mu's time, but still fresh enough where everyone who lived under the final ten emperors knew how good it used to be compared to now. Du Mu isn't just known for his poetry. He was also one of the more renowned writers of prose as well. He wrote poems of love and composed in all the styles, both old and modern. He loved women and wine and wrote many poems to celebrate both. Though he also wrote long, fu rhapsodies, Du Mu's short quatrains were perhaps his best-loved material. 
Let me read a couple for you. The first is one of Du Mu's more famous ones. It's called Dispelling Sorrows. Qian Huai. Luo Po Jiang Hu Zai Jiu Xing. Chu Yao Xian Xi Zhang Zhong Qing. Shi Nian Yi Jiao Yang Zhou Meng. Ying De Qing Lo Bo Xing Ming. Down on my luck, wandering and drunk. Oh, those slim-waisted girls of Chu in the palm of my hand. Ten years gone by, and I still dream of Yang Zhou. Why, even in the blue houses, you said I was fickle. And here's another one of Du Mu's greatest hits. It's called Qingming. Qingming Festival. Qingming shi jie yu fen fen. Lu shang xing ren yu duan hun. Jie wen jiu jia he chu you. Mu tong yao zhi xing hua cun. One day of Qingming festival, a drizzle rain falls. On the road, the traveler, disconsolate, inquiring, where can an inn be found? A cowherd boy points, far away to Apricot Blossom Village. Du Mu was very close friends with Li Shangyin. These two, Du Mu and Li Shangyin, they were the most celebrated poets of the late Tang and most representative of that period. Li Shangyin, he was the last of the Sanli, the three Li's who counted Mao Zedong amongst their fan club. He's also called the last of the great Tang poets. When he died in Zhengzhou in 858 or 859, the dynasty at a mere half century of sands left in their imperial hourglass. He too was known for more than just his poetry, the cult of Du Fu, if you will. Some say was launched by Li Shangyin. He made a lot of hay about Du Fu and pointed to his specialness and importance. So when later Song scholars said Du Fu was the greatest thing since Jian Bing, it was Li Shangyin who perhaps forced them to take notice. Like Du Fu, whose poetry helped reflect the high Tang times he lived in, Li Shangyin too, through his poetry, provided a window into the fading fortunes of the late Tang. In the 300 Tang poems, Li Shangyin had 24 included. Only Li Bai, Du Fu, and Wang Wei had more. He was famous, among many things, for his love poems. They weren't the happy, cheerful, or hopeful kind. They were more often than not sad and melancholy. By now, you're no doubt familiar with these early lives of the poets I've mentioned. Some had it easy, and some had it rough. Some had okay careers, most did not. Li Shangyin had to do everything the hard way. His father had been a low-ranking official and hadn't been able to turn a career in government into a path to riches. Upon his father's death, Li Shangyin and family moved to Luoyang. Like others, he too was one of those child prodigy types who showed so much promise and seemed destined for great things. After a few failures, at the age of 24 and 837, he passed the Jinshi exam. He ended up working in the Imperial Library, which suited him well. But by the time Li Shangyin started his career in the civil service, the government was fractured in a nest of vipers dominated by eunuchs. For most of his career, it was a series of positions that dealt with matters of taxation, crime, and paper pushing. He had the misfortune of living through six not-so-good emperors and worked for a couple of them. In 842, he got another chance to return to a position at the Imperial Library, but just as that dropped in his lap, his mother passed away, and he had to do what everyone else did, according to Confucian tradition, take three years off to mourn. But he did later return to the Imperial Library and was also a member of the Hanlin Academy. His career peaked with a position at the Ministry of Labor, and it wasn't as the minister. All in all, it was a holy unextraordinary career, and he died relatively young at the age of 45 in 858 in Zhengzhou after he had given up on his government career and found solace in Buddhism. His poetry didn't make him a star in his own lifetime, and Li Shangyin 
It wasn't for everyone. It seemed as if he often composed in a kind of secret code. His poetry is filled with all kinds of allusions that could mean any number of things. Like so many poets of this middle and late Tang period, he derived no small amount of inspiration from China's ancient literary past. In the trying times he lived in, it was only natural to hearken back to the good old days for China. The history, the myths, the ancient heroes and symbols. And like Du Fu, and certainly Li He, who I mentioned in this episode, Li Shangyin gets filed under hard to translate. Unlike Bai Zhu Yi, who we featured last episode, Li Shangyin in particular used the vaguest of language to express himself. And with classical Chinese and all the tricks of the trade, which maximized the breadth of meanings any single one character could have, his translated poems are sometimes all over the place. In more than a few sources, he was called a kind of master of ambiguity. And his somber and gloomy love poetry about secret or forbidden love, that's one thing about Li Shangyin that intrigued so many lovers of Chinese classical poetry. Li Shangyin also did one thing that stood out from the crowd. He wrote many of these Wu Ti poems. Wu Ti means no title. He wasn't the only one to do this, but anyone familiar with Li Shangyin knows many of his best poems were Wu Ti untitled. Like Li He, Li Shangyin also got to enjoy a bit of shine in the Qing dynasty, better late than never. All kinds of new Commentaries were written about his work, and he was really given the once-over by the academic community in the 18th century. Well, Li Shangyin, we can all agree, wasn't the first and he wasn't the last artist or literary figure to have died unappreciated in his own lifetime, only to be hailed as a master long afterwards. Here's a poem by Li Shangyin. The Moors featured this one in a Chinese literature podcast episode they did on him. It's called The Plains of Le Yo, Le Yo Yuan, Xiang Wan, Yi Bu Shi, Chu Che, Deng Gu Yuan, Xi Yang, Wu Xian Hao, Zhi Shi, Jin Huang Hun. Approaching evening, an uncomfortable feeling. I drive the carriage, mounting the old plains. The setting sun, limitlessly good. It's only that dusk is approaching. Liu Yo Yuan, Liu Yo Plain. That's an area to the south of Chang'an. In this simple four line Wu Yuan Jieju, five character regulated verse poem, one of the calling cards for Tang Dynasty poetry, Li Shang Yin reflects on the fading fortunes of the dynasty. There are a couple recent translations of Li Shang Yin's poems that. I listed in the links and resources at the webpage at uh, teacup.media. There's Li Shangyin, edited and translated by Chloe Garcia Roberts. That was published by the venerable New York Review of Books, part of the NYRB Poet Series. That just came out last year in 2018 and was most highly regarded. You might want to consider starting there. Also highly recommended is... Poems of the Late Tang, translated by A.C. Graham, also listed in the episode notes, and also published by the very same outfit as Chloe Garcia Roberts. Now, this one is terribly interesting, especially to anyone who digs Pink Floyd, man. Poems of the Late Tang was first published in 1965, and it was this edition that Roger Waters picked up somewhere, and he ended up lifting lines from poems by Li Shangyin, Li He, and Du Mu, the three poets featured in this episode. And if you go check out the Saucerful of Secrets album, the last one I think that Sid Barrett played on, and check out the third song on the album called Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, listen carefully because these lyrics are mumbled and not easy to hear. But you can hear Roger Waters speaking lines from these late Tang poets. I wonder if their estates received any of the royalties. So how many other Chinese poets from the Book of Odes to modern times can say their poems were used by a rock and roll band who sold a quarter billion records worldwide? I bet some of these quatrains make great tattoos also, if you get the characters facing the right way. 
You know, when I had this brainy idea a few months ago to try and cobble together a little overview of Tang poetry that wouldn't put you, my beloved listeners, to sleep, I envisioned this being a quick two-part series, three tops. But by part three, I sort of knew that once again, my eyes were bigger than my stomach. But in this final part eight episode, we're going to let the curtain fall right here. So if you think this was a lot of poetry, there's still the Five Dynasties, Ten Kingdoms period, the Song, Yuan, Ming, Qing, and modern times to go yet. And lovers of Chinese poetry all have their favorite poets from all these different eras. And I know it's not the biggest market in the world outside greater China. But for everyone who wants to give Chinese poetry a shot, there are so many great and talented translators and Every major world language lovingly translating all this Chinese poetry. If you can't read Chinese, read in translation. You'll still be able to appreciate it. If your interest has been piqued at all, let me assure you the resources available to you on the web are incredibly vast. And if you like to read your poetry the old-fashioned way from a printed book, there are more publishers of books on poetry out there than grains of sand. You could start with all the resources I recommended in the episode notes. And again, go check out Lee and Rob Moore's Chinese Literature Podcast. Okay, that is going to be the end of that. Onwards to the next great thing. I got something special lined up next time for all y'alls. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from beautiful and fantastic L.A., imploring you to consider coming back one more time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.